All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the family gathered in this place. Lord, and as we gather together to hear your words, just open our ears to hear, our eyes to see what you're showing us, Lord, and just reveal yourself even more. We give glory and honor to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So just like before, Proverbs 9.10 is the, the whole reason that we are doing this, that the knowledge of God is understanding. And so the more we learn about God, the more we gain wisdom and understanding as to who He is, what, how He operates in our life, and, and how we react. So the last, last time we looked at hands and just saw the different types of hands and you know, the hands of the Creator, the hands of the Provider, the hands of the Almighty, and the hands of the Father, and just how they, they work in our lives and operate. And in the process of me researching the hands, a lot came out about the right hand of God, the right hand of the Almighty. And so I, I wanted to, I didn't want to glance over that because it's important. It's mentioned multiple, multiple times in the Bible. And so we're going to be mostly focusing in the Psalms because it's David and the psalmists who recognize the work of the right hand of God. And so, you know, a little background is that the right hand symbolized strength. The right hand was the dominant hand. Anything other than the right hand was considered weakness. Um, you know, before the advent of toilet paper, the left hand was used. So you always shook with the right hand. You ate with the right hand. It was your strength. It was your, um, you know, provision, gathering things. It was your sword arm. So, so whenever a reference is referred to the Lord's right hand, it was, it was interesting to see how it was used because that was a focus. That was, um, it was a place of respect. So we're going to look at God's right hand. So in, we're going to start out in Isaiah 48, verse 13. And this is God speaking. He says, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call them up, they stand up together. Or when I call to them, they stand up together. So his right hand stretched out the heavens. So we talked about the Creator, and that He created all things. But it was His hand that stretched out the heavens. The, the strength of His right hand laid the foundations of everything. So that's just, that's just setting, setting the, the, the... What's that word I'm looking for? setting the stage. It's setting the stage to tell you just what the purpose of God, how God uses his right hand. And so if we go to Psalm 6, 17, verse 7. And so in verse 6, he says, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand, O oh, you who saves those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. So it's a loving, marvelous loving kindness of his right hand that rises up and saves those who call on him. Psalm 60 verse 5. Starting in verse 4, you have given a banner to those who fear you, that it might be displayed because of the truth, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. Psalm 108, 
verse 6. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth, that your beloved may be delivered, save with your right hand, and hear me. So it saves us. You know, we talked about the hands and how they protect and cover us, but it's the right hand that reaches out, reaches into our lives to save us and to deliver us from those that rise up against us. So he's moving, not in passivity, but in strength. His right hand is coming in with strength to save us. And so that's him just, just acting, right? It's, it's strong enough to roll out the heavens, and it's strong enough to deliver us from those that seek to destroy us. But so when we're looking at it in our lives, like how, how do we see it? How do we, how do we pick out? when God's right hand is in operation in our lives. You know, do, do, do we just expect him to, you know, grab us by the, the shirt collar and pick us up and move us somewhere? I mean, he could. But honestly, it's, it's delivering us from those that are lying. You know, the, the right hand of God is coming in. And so if somebody's, you know, spreading falsehoods, spreading lies about you, that right hand can come in and deliver you and reveal the truth. Save you from, you know, shame. Save his name from shame. Save him, save you, you know, from hurt and pain. You know, that can be an application of the Lord. But there's, there's something that I, I, I want us to look at, and, and we're going to take a look at it here shortly, is this, is that he strengthens us, and he strengthens us, our right hand with his you know it's he purposes for us to not be weak you know we we are weak and in our weakness he is strong but in our weakness he shows his strength by strengthening our right hand so if we go to psalm 16 verse 8 Starting in verse 7, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Though thousands may fall before me, the Lord is at my right hand and I won't be moved. Psalm 18 verse 35. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me, so my feet did not slip. So here he is not only holding me up and making us great, but he is, it it says again that he's going to straighten our path, make wide our path. And he keeps our feet from slipping. Isaiah 41.10. We'll start in verse 8. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called it from its farthest reaches and said to you, You are my servant, I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I will fear no evil, because you are with me promises right here in his own words he is speaking to Israel he's speaking to us those that are followers that he's called from its farthest reaches and he says to you Tyler you are my servant and I have chosen you and have not cast you away 
Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will, up, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, when everything seems against you, when life doesn't seem to go your way, when you sin and you start to see the darkness envelop you, it's the right hand that helps you up. It's the right hand that pulls you up. Psalm 80, and we'll start in verse 14. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. You know, so even here in this psalm, David's saying, I am your vine. I'm planted in this vineyard that you have put me in. And here I am. I feel like I'm burned with fire and I'm cut down. You planted me. You put me here. Your right hand placed me in a position of strength in a position that I need to be strong in, yet I am, I'm weak, I'm burnt, I'm cut down. But here he is calling on the right hand of God to come down and rest on him, to strengthen him. You know, this is, it's, it's important You know, he doesn't go, God, give me your hands, give me your hands. No, he pointedly calls to the Lord and asks him specifically for his right hand to reach out and strengthen him. I I can tell you honestly, before this time, I've never specifically asked for the Lord's right hand to come down and touch me. I've just cried out and said, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. And especially in my year and a half of being laid off, I cried out for him for this deliverance, for this protection, for the strength to go through some of the battles that I was dealing with. And lo and behold, as I'm looking back, I am clearly seeing the right hand come down and get me through that time, protect my family and get them through that time. It wasn't just me that I saw him strengthening. It was my wife. It was my kids. It was those around me as I was going through these things. He was strengthening them and bolstering their resolve to go through it, to see, to see and trust more. You know, as we rely on the right hand of God, people are watching us. People are watching you to judge you, to condemn you. You know, Christians are probably looking at you to to see, oh, how strong is their faith so they can pick you apart or feel better about themselves. You know, so how much in your weakness do you lean on that right hand of God? You know, we just read a bunch of promises that He's going to be there, that He won't forsake us, that He will lift us up. But how often have we leaned on that right hand to be our crutch, to lift us up when we've needed it? How often have we thanked the Lord for using His right hand, for actually reaching out physically to touch us, to lift us up? He doesn't delegate that to anybody else. You know, David doesn't say, Lord, thank you for sending your angels to strengthen my right hand. He says, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for your right hand. God is not too big to not be personal with us, to not personally reach out into our lives and personally touch because it's a personal relationship he seeks. 
you know, when, when people shook hands, you know, before legal agreements, a handshake was a legally binding thing. If you shook hands with somebody and you used your right hand, the Lord is using His right hand, and as He makes contact with us, He's making these promises and these vows. There is no, He's holding His left hand behind His back and crossing His fingers saying, I don't really mean it. There's no deceit in the Lord. The promises He makes, the promises He keeps. So Psalm 21 Start in verse 6. Excuse me. Start in verse 8. Your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. Your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. It's a right hand of justice seeking out those who hate the Lord they, that hate you because of him. And it says he's going to make them as a fiery oven in the time of his anger. He will swallow them up in his wrath. Shame will be heaped on their head. Coals will be heaped on their head because the Lord's right hand seeks out his enemies. He's not passive. We think, we, we think in, in our short-sightedness that the Lord is letting the unrighteous succeed. But God plays the long game, too. And so he's seeking out ways and giving those that are unrighteous plenty of time to repent. You know, I'm thankful that the Lord doesn't just burn me to a cinder when I sin. He gives me time to repent, to realize my sin. You know, that's the mercy of God. So he's, in a sense, withholding his right hand, the execution of judgment, which would be death. But because he knows the hearts of men, he goes after it. He seeks out after it. In Exodus 15, and we're starting in verse 1, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Verse 6, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath, it consumed them like stubble, and with a blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The right hand of God grants victory. You know, he is a man of war. So in his hand, he is his right hand, if you looked at it, would be calloused with the practice of his weapon. It is a hand that is known war. It's a hand that has, is, is used to the execution of judgment and wrath and righteousness and deliverance on behalf of us, those who trust in Him. So, He not only strengthens us, 
to get us through these these time the tough times the 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 woe is me times but he his hand will then grant us victory it will lift us up it will strengthen us and it will grant us victory if we call out and cry out for the right hand so if we hit up psalm 48 Starting in verse 9. We have thought, O God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple. According to your name, O God, so is your praise to the end of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgment. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Psalm 89. Starting in verse 11. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world is In all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, you rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Psalm 118. Starting in verse 15. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. In the tents of the righteous... The the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. It is exalted. In all these verses, it's talking about the power and how righteous this right hand is. You know, us in our hatred, in our sinfulness, in our humanness, we're, we're very likely to just lash out at people. You know, how many times before you hear the full truth are you already formulating a response and a retort to somebody that you feel has wronged you? Yet come to find out that they've either been misquoted, they weren't even talking about that, they didn't even say that, it was just somebody's lying tongue. You know, but here we are, the Lord's righteous right hand doesn't move without purpose. It, it is exalted, and it, it, it's, it is a position of power. That's understood in the tense of the righteous. And so I want, I want us to understand that, yes, the right hand moves, and it's accustomed to warfare, but it is righteous and exalted. It's not... It, it, it's in that, in its righteousness and exalt, and in exalted status, we should be looking towards that. You know, we should be looking and searching for that right hand. And so what happens when you look at the right hand, look for the right hand? Go to Acts 7. And we'll start in verse 54. Actually, you know what, we'll start in 51. This is Stephen. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You always, always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law but by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen 
as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So when you look for the right hand of God, you are looking for a, a hand that is, that is so strong, so powerful that it is spread out the heavens, that it saves us, that it strengthens you, and it grants you victory. But at the right hand of God is Jesus Christ himself. So you not only see the power and might of the right hand, you see Jesus standing there. You know, and me and a buddy, you know, in an effort to kind of know, you know, know more about, about Jesus and his life and, and, you know, what is his purpose post-cross, we kind of did this research, you know, and so, okay, he came you know, died for our sins and, and, and everything that's understood. But, you know, once he died as, a, as the Savior, you know, and took all our sins, is, there, is, is he doing anything beyond the grave, beyond being raised to the right hand? Is he doing anything for us? And the answer I found is yes. If you read Acts 5.31, this is what I found kind of just, it, it was interesting to me in, in a sort of revelation, is that here in Acts 5, starting in verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Verse 31, him God exalted to his right hand, to be prince and savior. But this is what I found interesting. The rest of that verse says, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And, he, and we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those whom, who obey him. So the right hand of God, Jesus is standing there. And in, according to this verse... God has delegated the forgiveness of sins to Jesus Christ himself. It says it right there. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You know, so, so we, we, we pray in the name of Jesus because it's through his blood that we can be heard. You know, God can grant forgiveness of sins. But... He delegates it to Jesus Christ. You know, who better to, who better to understand the desperate need of forgiveness than one who was fully man and fully God? You know, yes, God understands it, but Jesus fully understands the, the draw of sin, the... the desire for sin but he overcame it and so here he is under, saying Tyler I understand your struggle and I understand that you fall but here I am you're asking me for it I grant you repentance and I forgive your sins you know because when we sin not only do we sin against God but we sin against everything that Jesus did for us You know, when we take for granted our sins and that, that our sin, when we sin, we can ask for forgiveness, we're taking for granted the struggle and the pain that Jesus went through to die for us. And because God knows the, the immense struggle, the immense importance of what Jesus did, he elevated him to his right hand. This right hand that saves this right hand that strengthens us, he put Jesus there. You know, if you look back at that Acts 7, you know, in, in 54 through, through 60, who's he cry out to? He doesn't cry out to God, he cries out to Jesus. 
He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And here he is as he's looking... He's looking up at Jesus. He's seeing the open heavens. He's seeing God and Jesus together. He's saying, Lord. He's directing this. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. I have to believe he's looking at Jesus. Because God gave him, granted him the authority to forgive sins. Go to Romans 8, 4, 34. We'll start in 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered, up, delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I have to understand that I am seeking Jesus Christ's forgiveness of sins. And then the Lord says, yo, Jesus, I have this thing against Tyler. And Jesus says, nah, no, 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 his account's good. I have forgiven his sin. And God says, okay, cool. Probably not quite the conversation that happens in heaven, but we'll just say I was paraphrasing. <laughs> so God, God is asking, he has to. In God's righteousness, with his righteous hand, he has to account for sin. Sin cannot go unpunished, period. If it doesn't go unpunished, he's not God. He's not who he says he is. So it has to be punished. But because Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price for, uh, for my sins, your sins, and sacrificed himself, if I repent and ask him for forgiveness, Jesus says, I forgive you. And he says, God, the Father, he's forgiven. Don't hold it against him. And God goes, poof, as far as the east is from the west. My sins, he knows no more. You know, and Jesus himself speaks to this. In Matthew 9, verse 6, we'll start in verse, we'll just start in Matthew 9, verse 1. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic man on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your thought, in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? Verse 6. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Jesus Christ, before he is risen, testifies to the authority that he is given. And now he is raised even more at the right hand of God, honored, 
for the sacrifice that he has done. So why do we look to the right hand? For salvation, for forgiveness of sins, because that is where it comes from. It's, you seek the salvation of the, the righteous hand, but you also seek the one that's standing there. At the right hand is the position of power. And I don't think God's just going to elevate anybody to be prince and savior. So when we sin, when we fall, when we struggle, when we're in good times, when we're in bad times, seek the right hand. Seek the hand that is exalted. Seek the hand that is righteous that strengthens us, that has promised to save you. And it's strong enough to do what he says it can do. But don't forget who also stands at the right hand of God. It's the one that deserved it. It's the one that took all my sin and bore it on the cross. And in Him, all authority is given to forgive sins and to accept repentance. So that in the day of God's wrath, you don't have to experience the nasty side of the right hand. So you want the right hand in your life. But in order for that right hand to move, you got to look to the one who's at the right hand for forgiveness of sins and keeps in check that wrath, which is the price and the, and the result and the judgment of the sin that we have, that we accrue. Look to the right hand for salvation. The right hand of God saves, and the one at the right hand forgives. And feel free to cry out to both. Because there are promises made by both of them that they will move heaven and earth for you. So Lord, we thank you for your saving grace, your saving right hand, the one that keeps us and strengthens us when we are weak that gets us through those tough times, those terrible times, the times of death and defeat. And we thank you that you have elevated the Son of Man to your right hand, that you have given him all authority to forgive our sins. And so Jesus, right now, we look to you at the right hand as the heavens open, just like Stephen did all that those many years ago. We cry out to you and say, for, ask you to forgive us our sins. Make us righteous. That the Lord will not withhold his right hand from us, but deliver us from evil and our enemies. All glory and honor to the right hand of the Most High. All glory to the one that sits at the right hand. Jesus Christ, and it's in His precious name we pray. Amen.